Hello and welcome to Noel's Retro Lab. Today we're going to be restoring this Atari 65XE. I'm actually not as familiar with this one as I am with some of the other Atari 8-bit line like the 600XL or the 800XL, so we're all going to be learning new things as we go. Before we do anything else, let's fire it up and see if it works. Here is the Atari 65XE. And let's start having a look at it just so we have something to compare it to once we're done with it and, and so that we know what we're likely to have to be doing to it. The case looks to be in pretty good condition. There's nothing broken. It's, it's, it's good. The keys are all there, so all that is good. When you look at it a little bit more closely, it's definitely a little dirty. That's nothing we can fix. But it has this very ugly, uneven yellowing. You know, I'm, I'm not a fan of yellowing in computers. I know some people are okay with it. If you've seen some of my other videos, you know that I try to retro bright things when they get really yellow. But I really don't like this uneven yellow like there. And some keys are yellow there, but not there. So I sense there's some retro brighting happening in our future. Other than that, it looks to be in really good shape. What exactly is the Atari 65XC? It's part of the Atari 8-bit line of computers, which started with the Atari 400 and 800, and that was right after the famous Atari 2600. That started in 1979. It was followed by the Atari 600 and 800 XL around 1983, and then the XE line came starting in 1985, but it was pretty much a cosmetic upgrade to the XL. At the very end, and probably not as important, was an attempt to make a console out of this computer system, and it was released as the XEGS. The amazing thing about this for me is that this family spans from the late 1970s until the early 1990s, and they're all very similar to each other. So it's an amazing technology feat, or at least a marketing feat. We plug in the power cable and the video cable, and it looks like we get nothing initially. But then I remember that I had something similar happen with the Atari 600 XL, and it just wasn't able to get the image in the normal range. But then if I let it scan for a while, it actually found another place where the image would appear more or less correctly with some noise. And the same thing happened here. So it looks like it's actually working, even though the image quality is not very good. So the next thing is to try the composite video out, since I already have the cable from the Atari XLs. And yep, that works great. <laughs> Much better image quality too. I remember from the other Atari 8-bit that if you start the computer while holding the Option key, it brings up a menu with several tests. So let's run the memory test to make sure that everything looks good. And yep, it took a while, but it seems like it passes everything. Let's also test the keyboard. Yeah, we have a lot of keys that are not working. Apart from some keys, there's also a whole row that isn't working, so chances are this is a bad membrane. I just remember there's also a keyboard test in that menu, so let's try it. And yeah, it shows that we have a lot of keys that are not working. I actually have a system check card for Atari 8-bit computers. I wasn't thinking about using it for this one because uh, I figured that it was just for the XL computers. I know they have some different ports in the back, but it turns out this one fits on the XE computer just fine. It fits in the cartridge port and the other slot right there. So let's give it a try. Maybe it will uncover something else that needs to be fixed. This one also takes a while to run and it seems to pass all the memory tests. And it seems to also check a few other things with the graphics chip, maybe, and the ROMs, and everything passes, so that's great. The next step is to open it up, see what exactly is inside, and give it a good cleaning all around. We should also have a look at that keyboard membrane and see if we can fix it. I flipped the Atari to open it up, and I noticed that the bottom looks really bad. Apart from having some of those burn marks that you know kind of like melt the case that happens from the cables, it looks like it's full of rust in here. So at least the RF shield it must be rusted. And I don't know what that means for the condition of the board. So I guess we're about to find out. Oh, wow. That's disgusting. That's much worse than I expected from the outside. This is all rusted and full of dust.
Yeah, all that rust. Hmm. Let's take the board out of the case. We just need to unscrew a couple of screws. And oh, wow, this is really bad. I did not expect this at all. Let's start by cleaning that disgusting case. It's rust, so I'm not sure it's going to come out, but we'll start with water and soap anyway. Since that didn't work, we'll try a mineral remover product for cleaning bathrooms. It's slightly acidic, so hopefully we'll eat into the rust. Nope, that didn't do it either. We need something stronger. All right, let's try with some straight vinegar and let it sit there for a while. While the bottom case is soaking in vinegar, we'll remove the yellowing on the top case. So we'll use the 40 volume hydrogen peroxide cream that we used other times. Dilute it a little bit and apply it all over the case. You can't just apply it on the part that is yellow because you'll end up with uneven yellowing. And this doesn't just whiten the case, it actually reverses the chemical reaction. So it brings the original color back to the case. So it's okay to apply it everywhere. Let's see if that vinegar worked. And no, not at all. All right, well, the strongest thing I have on hand is hydrochloric acid. This is really potent stuff, so I'm putting my gloves on. Let's put a few drops here and wait a few minutes. Let's turn our attention to the keyboard now. I'll remove the keys, clean them well as usual. And we're gonna try to remove some of that yellowing. So I'm putting them in this bag and filling it with hydrogen peroxide, just the regular concentration you can find in a pharmacy. We'll put it out outside to get some sun rays, even if it's through the clouds. And at the same time, we refresh a little bit the case and make sure it stays wet all the time. Let's see if that worked. Oh yeah, it's coming out finally. Okay, so let's just put more acid all over and leave it there a few more minutes. And yeah, it's definitely coming out. Okay, I can do this a couple more times and I think it's going to be good. And after a lot of acid and a lot of scrubbing, wow, what a difference. This is, and this is not perfect. There's still a few spots with some rust in them, but this is totally, totally functional for the bottom of the case that you don't even see. The bottom part still has those two ugly marks, but, um, all the other rust spots in there are gone. So yeah, that's, that's very good. Time to remove the RF shield and get to the board. At first I thought it was welded shut, but it has these tabs that you need to straighten and then the two pieces of the RF shield come apart. Let's remove the bottom RF shield as well. And there's the board. It's kind of dirty, but it's actually in pretty good condition considering how bad the RF shield was. I think we can just give it a good dusting and it may be good enough. I always like to have a look at the boards and sort of identify the major parts in them. So while we're here, let's take a look at the Atari 65 XC board. The first thing we have is the CPU, which is kind of hard to find a little bit because you're looking for the MOS 6502, but it's actually labeled as something else. So I actually had to look it up to see which of those it was. Then very clearly on the left, we have a bank of 64K of RAM. And it's actually really cool that right next to it, we have what it looks like a blank bank of 64K. So chances are on this particular board, we could upgrade it to 128K of RAM, making it very similar to the 130XE model. Next, we have the Pokey sound chip, which is one of the most distinctive parts of the Atari 8-bit. 
It has a great music. Maybe one day I'll do a video on the different kinds of music of 8-bit systems. Then down there we have two ROMs, the OS ROM and the basic ROM. Next we have the PIA, which is the peripheral interface adapter, maybe? Anyway, it deals with interfacing of the external things, probably like the joystick ports and things like that. Then we have the Antec chip, which is kind of the core of the Atari 8-bit architecture. It deals with the graphics generation along with the GTIA chip, which stands for Graphic Television Interface Adapter. So those two chips will generate the graphics. And then finally, I left it for last because I wasn't sure what it was at first. We have the Freddy chip, which is something that was only added in later Atari 8-bit models, and it's a memory demultiplexer, so it allows access to different parts of the RAM. There's still a fair amount of rust left from the RF shield on the board, so I'm going to try cleaning it up a little bit, just with some alcohol, and it seems to come out okay. So the board looks a lot better after some cleaning. It still has a few traces of rust, but it's mostly on the outside on the ground plane, so I think it's going to be fine. Same thing with that. The RF modulator looks really bad, but I'm hoping it's just the lid. So let's, see if it... let's open it up. Yeah, the inside seems totally fine. So maybe the lid, we can just sand it down and spray paint it. The back looks good too. The only two things, let's see if I can zoom in. There we go. This, look, this looks a little rusty and specifically there. And this is the keyboard connector. So it's probably nothing, but I guess our bad key connections could be caused by one of those solder points being bad. So I'm just gonna reflow those. And then same thing over here. These look a little bad. And those are the inputs to the RF modulator. So it won't hurt to reflow them as well. And then we'll give the board a test. Actually, before we can test out anything, we need to take out the keyboard membrane and see if we can fix it. So we need to remove all these 2000 tiny screws in the back. And then very carefully take out the membrane, which has this weird folded part that goes through the metal backing. Wow, even the membrane has rust from the RF shield. That thing is everywhere. So we first wipe down the membrane, and actually we need to do this very carefully because we don't want to wipe away some of the conductive material at each of the key spots. And I don't know if it'll do any good, but I'll try to remove some of that rust in there as well. The keyboard plate was actually pretty rusty as well, so I sanded it down and I'm going to spray it with a galvanizing sink paint, which protects it from rusting again. And we'll do the back as well. Here's the final result with the spray paint. The finish is not totally perfect. I think that was maybe because I was towards the end of the spray, so it clumped up a little bit in a few places, but it doesn't really matter. The important thing is that this is not rusty anymore and it will not continue rusting. That keyboard is looking a lot better. Now let's test it. Yeah, no change. Still lots of keys not working. So for example, the whole second row of keys is not working. So we can see here in the keyboard matrix that that would correspond to two tracks in the keyboard membrane. So 
most likely the membrane is bad, but let's have a look at it just in case. I took out the membrane to examine it a little bit more closely and overall it seems fine. I don't see any, any obviously broken tracks in there. The plastic is still flexible and healthy, so it's not just cracking away. But as I looked at it more closely in this, in this area over here that is bent like this, check that out right there. So clearly, those tracks are cracked. I thought about trying to repair that, maybe scrape the plastic a little bit on both sides and apply some conductive paint. But the problem is that this is right at this very, very bent area. So I honestly don't think there's anything that we can do about this. So instead, I just looked it up and people are making new membranes for this computer today. So I just ordered one. Unfortunately, it won't be here in time for the end of the video, but it should be a matter of getting the new one, popping it in on the keyboard and everything should work. So other than that, everything is looking good. So let's reassemble the computer and give it a quick test. So this is the case after the retro brighting and it looks much better. It wasn't very yellow to start with, but this is perfect. This is very uniform and it's the color that it was initially. So I'm, I'm very happy with the results. The RF shield was in horrible condition. So I initially thought about just getting rid of it, but then I realized we could give it a similar treatment like we did with the keyboard metal plate. So we're going to sand down all the rust until there's none left. Once all the rust is gone, you still have all those black spots, but that's normal. And now we can apply the same spray paint that will seal the metal in and prevent it from rusting again. And of course, we need to apply it to the other side as well. The RF shields are looking great now, so let's reassemble everything back together. No, I forgot to put the modulator shield back on. And I can't put it in with the RF shield already in place. Arrgh. I guess I need to undo this one. And the final result? Yeah, that looks much better. Let's just give it a quick test. Okay, it boots up. Unfortunately, it can't do much without half of the keys not working. I try putting an SD card to attempt to load some games, but even trying to select the game to load requires some keys that are not working. So we're out of luck there. And here's the final result. On the outside, yeah, it's a little better than it was before, but on the inside, wow, that's a whole other computer. Overall, I think it came out really well and I'm very happy with the result. Now I just need to wait for that keyboard membrane and it will be as good as new just about. I hope you enjoyed the video and if so, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Until next video, see you then.